That was Professor David Pasig of Bar Ilan University in Israel. Now, Professor Pasig said that he believes the human race is just at the beginning of its journey. Do you agree with him? Because some people think the human race might be nearing the end of its journey. Uh, well, that's an interesting question. If you talk about uh, the higher features of human beings, our intelligence, our complexity, um, our humanity, I absolutely think we're at the very beginning still, and there's so much ahead. I share his optimism. Will biological human beings be at the top of the pyramid in uh, even 50 years from now? I don't think so. I think we're very close now to a transition to a far, far faster world with much deeper machine intelligence all around us. And these tools we use today, these um, um, cell phones and laptops, uh, they're really digital extensions of ourselves. And we're going to see them grow in sophistication and ability in amazing ways just in the next 10 years. Now, some people say that the defining feature of the future society will not be so much the technology, but the values and beliefs of that society. What do you think are the suitable values and beliefs for the future society? Well, I think this gets back to your theory of change. It's a fantastic question, Marty. Um, my theory of change is that uh, all complex systems are engaging in both evolutionary processes, as uh, Dr. Passig was talking about, but also developmental processes. And so we have evolutionary and developmental values this, this around is, This is processes. Evo Devo, something you call Evo Devo. You're involved with this yes. group that promotes that. Yes. So if you remember Darwin's Tree of Life, that's an evolutionary process. Uh, something starts with a single uh, cell, for example, and evolutionary processes are constantly branching. They're constantly creating variety, specialization, and diversity. And so there's tree processes all through biology, technology, society, where we see more diversity, more specialization, more variety. Developmental process is exactly the opposite. It's taking the chaos out of a system and hitting a future target. Think of two genetically identical twins. Everything about them that matters on the molecular scale is actually evolutionarily different. Their fingerprints are different. The way their brains are wired up is different. Those processes all happen in a selectionist, bottom-up, evolutionary manner. And yet, those two twins hit targets that are the same on the system level. Look at them from across the room, they look the same. So when you talk about social development, economic development, technological development, universal development, you're talking about funnel processes. And I would say the values that we associate commonly with evolutionary processes are things like diversity, individuation, competition, traditional Western values. On the developmental side, we associate concepts like sustainability, universality, cooperation, pretty much opposite or bookends to the evolutionary values. Both of these seem to be fundamentally important to the future. Do you think we'll ever be able to control the future and make it to our order, or do you think that the things we can't control will always be stronger than the things we can control? Well, St. St. Francis of Assisi said, universe grant me the um, uh, courage to change the things I can, the, wi the wisdom to understand the things I can't change, um, and the, uh, the uh, serenity, uh, or sorry, the, wisdom, the serenity to accept the things I can't change and the wisdom to know the difference. And I think that's pretty much how life works. There's certain things we can change, we steer towards, and there's certain things that are coming at us like tidal waves, and one of those is accelerating uh, computational intelligence. That's something that I don't think we could really uh, take out of, the universe, out of the human future, barring complete elimination of our catastrophe of the species. And so those are the kinds of things that uh, we pretty much guide rather than control. Now, should we look at this anticipation, with great anticipation, like this will be a wonderful thing when this technology advances? Or should we look at it with maybe a little bit of fear because maybe we'll become less significant and our lives won't be quite as important? Maybe the machines won't even need us anymore after a while. Well, there's an assumption here. And the assumption is that as the machines get more complex, they stay separate from us. And, and I, don't, I don't buy that assumption. I think the machines are going to be ever more intimately connected with us, as Ray says in his books. And you will talk about an electronic Marty, and I'll talk about an electronic John. 
And while I'm asleep and while you're busy, our electronic versions will be doing things for us even just 10 or 15 years from today. We'll have avatars that do these things. And we'll start to see ourselves as in both places. So I think our greatest challenge is gardening, if you will, our technologies so that they reflect our higher selves. Now, one of the biggest problems in human life is the fact that human beings often don't get along with each other. And technology can be turned into a weapon just as easily it can be turned into a source of benefit. Uh, is there any way of planning for the future that we can deal with that issue where some people just don't want to uh, go with somebody else's program? I think there are. And the book uh, Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker, which talks about the why violence has declined in the West over the last several hundred uh, years, is a fantastic an optimistic look at how violence uh, reduces in severity the more complex uh, and the more um, intelligent our, our simulations of the world become. At some point, do we have to wonder what makes existence fulfilling? So, for example, I could have a robot that runs into the kitchen for me and brings me back a sandwich, but maybe I'd rather do that myself. I mean, is it the goal to save labor is, is the ultimate goal to expend as little effort as possible? I mean, and what is it that makes life fun and, and worth experiencing? I would say, again, back to this Evo Devo value set, things that uh, we can predict that we've done before, we try and put them into unconsciousness and not think about them. So we add them on as skills, like driving a car or, or operating a tennis racket. But then we're constantly also trying to grow our tree of life trying to get into new areas that no one has gone to before in the arts, in the sciences, in, in business. And so I think that we're really trying to relax and challenge ourselves both at the same time. Are there any particular pitfalls that we need to be aware of as we go into the future, these gotchas that maybe uh, could trip us up? Well, as the technologies get more complex, individuals can do more destructive things with them, even as the average amount of violence has gone down. So I think we have to look to our own biology and understand how it protects itself. We have immune systems that go everywhere in our body. Now, if you remember Minority Report, those little spider robots that were going through the buildings uh, looking, at, looking for Tom Cruise, I think that is a pretty accurate description of the kind of uh, immune systems and technology we're going to have to have in 100 years because people, individuals, will have tremendous power for good or ill so we'll have to have a very complex set of immune systems and federations of, of uh, political systems creating those, so no one organization controlling them. So do you think the human race as a whole might turn out to be somewhat analogous to a human individual? Every organ of the human body has an analog in society as a whole? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a direct analog, but I would say the global brain concept or the global organism, the global superorganism concept, which has been around since the 1930s, is very accurate. Okay. We could go on for quite a bit longer, but I've just gotten the signal that we're just about out of time, so we are going to have to wrap the show. I'd like to thank my guest, John Smart of the Acceleration Studies Foundation, also uh, David Passig from Bar Ilan University in Israel. That interview was taped earlier. Thank you for watching. Please visit our website www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman. We'll see you next time.